Okay. All right, let's do this. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Have touch, please. All quiet, please. Thank you. Um, so, shh, thank you for your cooperation and moving uh, steadily back into the class and so forth. Um, we may be, hopefully we're not going to be impacted by this too, too much um, during the week as far as just like keeping it quiet when people are going around. Uh, this classroom is used for a lot of the IB tests just because, um, I don't know, just, it just happens. And it'll be used in the morning, so tomorrow morning. What do you guys, first period? English, yeah. So the seniors will be in here doing the last part of the history exam, which, by the way, next year, those of you guys who are in my presence for my last year with you, are going to be moving forward in a great way uh, as far as your IB history because you're going to get the history research done, the history paper, and I will work with you. Um, that's like a 20% of the overall score, and I get that done with, this, with the juniors. Yeah, no, it's really good because then you don't have to mess with it in the senior year, um, which is really good because I, I remember when I first took over the IB history, um, the people who I had as seniors and like, so how much did you get done last year on your IB uh, research, like your what's called the internal assessment, the IA, and they're like, oh, nothing. So we did the whole thing senior year. Anyway, but um, steadily we've been able to do this, and the really nice thing is you're going to be able to uh, pick pretty much whatever topic kind of thing in history with some guidelines. I mean, it varies from like something having to do with food. I've got a student doing one on a research on history of peanut butter. Um, some people are doing like some of the things that we do a lot of in class, which is war, war, war. There's other kinds of cultural kinds of things and so forth. But anyway, we'll talk more about that next year with those of you guys in my presence when we start next year, which starts, I don't know, a week after we finish. Just kidding, no. We're going to be it starts in late August. We're going to be on the same schedule as the elementary, so yes, we will be having our first semester exams after Christmas, but hey, whatevs. At least we'll like have a fairly decent summer break, which starts at, what, like noon on June 10th? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a half day for exams. And in fact, I think I see you guys I think I'll, about last time I'll have you guys will be on June 7th because we'll have, I have a feeling, the afternoon exams. And then after that, on the last two days of school, it'll be like half days. Does that make sense? Okay. So what we're doing in here is we have next, have your notes out, equal protection. Woof. You think the First Amendment has a lot of controversy and so forth involved? Equal protection. This is huge. This is a huge one. Okay? You ready? Write it down. 14th Amendment. In fact, have open your packets right to the bottom. We're going to be talking about this. 14th Amendment, equal protection. And it's one of those ones where it starts out meaning one thing, and then it's going to mean a variety of different things over history. So by the time we get to it, something that came out of the Civil War having to do with African Americans is ultimately going to be interpreted having to do with the right to have same-sex marriage. Okay? So this is the Supreme Court interpreting the Constitution and all the different component parts. So let's start with what we know. The 14th Amendment came after the 13th and before... Very good. Excellent. You guys are brilliant. Did, here's the question, Connor, <laughs> since you're so brilliant, did the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments come close together or was there a lot of years apart? This is true. Write this down as well. And after what major event in U.S. history? Go for it. Very good. After the Civil War. And who won the Civil War? The North. Okay, the Union. And so, do you remember? This is kind of a double check. You can make a little note of this. You're obviously going to have to know, and we'll cover it officially later. What did the 13th Amendment do? Perfect. Got rid of slavery. What did the 15th Amendment do? Not quite. Not quite. African Americans to vote. So it's, it's, a, it's that voting rights component thing. Okay? You got that? Okay? African Americans are going to be able to vote, vote, vote. All right, now. Well, yes. Basically, it's like, yeah, you, you cannot have your right to vote denied on the basis of your race or 
condition of previous servitude. Okay? All right? You got it? All right. So, what did the 14th Amendment do? Here we go. Write this down. Question? Depends on the laws of the states. Some states are quite limited. Uh, for example, if you're in prison, that means you're in Idaho, you're, you've been convicted of a felony. And felony convictions lead to the loss of voting privileges. But in Idaho, you can get them back after you complete your term and you've completed the parole properly. Yeah. It depends. And this is why it's like a, the particular answer. It depends on each state and the rules and so forth. Uh, my daughter, when she was uh, a student at Boise State University, she did a whole like major research paper on the voting rights and laws in Kentucky and found Kentucky was one of the most restrictive. Um, once you lose your right to vote there, you may never get it back. Okay? Other states are, have a little bit more allowance and so forth as far as that goes. Okay? No, wrong, yeah, yeah, no, she did some research, hello, hello, we did research, so are you guys ready? All right, now, here we go, okay, are you guys focused? Some of you guys have got like a little, uh, like something tickling your fancy and so forth, all right, ready? Anna, are you okay? Hold it together, don't look at her, don't look at her, don't look at her. Yeah, just every time I get this, like, you know, thing, something's, like, really hilarious, and I'm like, I'm, it's not me. Are you okay? All right, here we go. So write this down about the 14th Amendment. Okay. One of the key things about the 14th Amendment, it's got a lot of different interesting parts, due process components, um, which basically says, hey, if you've got due process rights, the right to life, liberty, and, and property, and it can't be taken away without some court, uh, uh, some court procedure, that's in the Fifth Amendment that says the federal government can't take it away. 14th Amendment says the state governments can't take it away either. But that's only one part of the 14th Amendment. What I want you to focus on is the equal protection of the laws. Write this down. This is what we're going to be focusing on. No one shall be denied, no citizen of the United States shall be denied the equal protection of the law by a state. So this is the 14th Amendment is interesting. It's one of the first times in the Constitution you have state governments don't even think about doing this. Because previously it was all like, the United States government can't do this, Congress can't do this, the federal government can't do this. But now specifically they're saying, states, don't mess around with this. If you're a U.S. citizen and you're in, living in a state, states cannot treat you unequally. It's actually not that hard to figure out kind of what was going on there, right? Were southern states, the Confederate states, were they treating people unequally before the Civil War? Yes. I mean, hello. Yeah. I mean, if you're African-American, more, more than likely you were enslaved in the Deep South. Were the slaves freed voluntarily by the South as in like, oh, wow, that's a wrong thing to do. We should just like get rid of slavery. No, no it was as a result of a war. Okay. So the war is over. Slaves are no longer slaves. African-Americans have the right to vote. And make sure you put this down. The southern states, in a sense, are put on notice. Don't try to bring all that nonsense back. Do you understand? Don't try to bring it all back. Don't try and set up a law that says, oh, well, depending on the color of your skin, you can do this or you can do that. That seems to be what the 14th Amendment was trying to say. Don't be treating people unequally. Otherwise, what? Mom's going to come into the room and, mm, yeah. As in, who's mom? Who are we talking about? Federal government. Now, actually put this down, because this is very important that you know this. We covered this actually, well, we covered it during COVID in the ninth grade, so some of you guys may be more tuned in than others. When the Union won the Civil War in 1865, did Union troops go into the South to ensure that the South lost, that the slaves are free, and that the former slaves would be treated equally? Yes. What was that period of history referred to as? Reconstruction. And it lasted at most maybe 10, 12 years in the Deep South. I would be pointing to my presence. We've got them covered up right now because of the, the history test. We'll take it down another time. But it was in 1876 
that reconstruction essentially ended when the North was like, uh, well, we can't be bothered anymore to have Union troops in the South ensuring the rights of freed African Americans. Because who doesn't like having Union troops in the South ensuring the rights of freed African Americans? Southern whites, yeah. And they were complaining and they were protesting and so forth. It's kind of like, oh, wow, can we just end this? Well, they finally ended it after 1876. Okay? After 1876, in a compromise between Republicans and Democrats and a big national presidential election things, the Democrats, it was a closely context, contested race. The Democratic candidate was, was, the Democrats were like, okay, you can have the presidency for how long? <laughs> Four years, because that's as long as the presidency lasts. But what did the Republicans, in a sense, have to give up? Further support of Union troops in the South. So write that down. 1876 and thereafter, the Union troops are pulled out of the South. So who's in charge in the South again? The South. And what is the majority population? White. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, African American, depending on where you go, some counties it's going to be higher and lower. Generally, it's about a third African American population in the Deep South. Okay. And so what you started to see in the 1870s, latter part of the 1870s and into the 1880s and into the 1890s, is a return kind of to the way things were. Not slavery, almost up to the spot. You had all kinds of different rules that were set up making life difficult for African Americans. And of course, the critical thing, if you want to have power, ladies, when do you in the Constitution get power to participate in government? 19th Amendment, when you get the right to vote. Because when you get the right to vote, you get the right to hire people to elective office, and you get the right to fire them. Got that? Yeah. It's been 100 years. Yeah. Oh, at age 18, yes. Now, yeah, actually, I was referring to as far as, like, um, your, your gender. Yeah, I mean, women couldn't vote in most parts of the country except for 100 years ago. And it wasn't that much longer in places like Idaho. And Wyoming was the first, but that was still near the end of the 1800s. So what did you start seeing? Write this down. In the Deep South, you started seeing a return to the way things were. Okay? A return to the way things were. And let's go to the very first case. Oh, yeah. How much was anticipated? Let's put gay marriage here between abortion and socialized medicine. Anyway, that's a... Do you think, there, <laughs> do you think that is a, a positive thing about the judicial restraint uh, or... Uh, uh, um, activism, fairly, fairly uh, critical, okay? So it's going to be interesting as far as, like, how do we interpret the 14th Amendment. All right. By 1896, by 1896, write this down. It's the Plessy versus Ferguson case, and you guys have actually read about it, so you should be fairly familiar with it, but we're going to go ahead and put it in your notes to make sure you know all about it. In, 18, in 1896... A law was challenged, and this is a law in the Deep South. I forget which state it was. I want to say like Alabama, Mississippi. Anyway, a number of the Deep Southern states had similar laws, and they were segregation laws. Okay? They were laws that were established by the government to separate people in public life on the basis of race, skin color. Got that? The specific one here said, on transportation, on a train, African Americans will be kept separate from whites. Got that? Now, as it turns out, was there a qualitative difference in the transportation provided depending on whether you're African American or white? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you could sensibly pay more and sit in first class. Well, the first class section was only available to whites. And when an African American, I always forget if it's Plessy or Ferguson as far as like who the, who the uh, particular party is here. I want to say Plessy, but nevertheless, an African American purchased a first class ticket, paid more. He wanted to sit in the first class accommodations. Well, that was a violation of the law of that state. He told, well, there must have been some mistake and you should have never been sold this ticket. Nevertheless, since you're sold this ticket, you need to get out of this section of the train and go sit in the segregated 
all African-American part of the train. Do you understand that? And he objected to that. He objected and says that is a violation of the 14th Amendment. He says the 14th Amendment on its face is intended to make sure that there is not the discrimination based on race and that there is equal treatment under the law. And this is not equal treatment under the law. Arguably, this guy probably is pretty darn close in his argument to meeting the intent of the amendment as it was created. I mean, would he have much of an argument for the people who like, got that into the Constitution? No. I mean, and mostly it was the winners who got that into the Constitution. Basically, if you're a southern state and you're like, can we get back in the union? And you're like, yeah, but you've got to make sure you, you ratify the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Okay, fine, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then, of course, then the southern states are like, well, I wonder how long the union is going to feel like they f they're going to keep those troops there. Answer, 1876. And by you can see, 1890s, the mood of the country was well, quite different. Question. Plessy was African-American, thank you. I always think it was Plessy. And Ferguson must have been like the government official that got sued on behalf. Very well, yeah. I mean, it could be, yeah. In any event, what's at stake here then is how is the court going to interpret the 14th Amendment? Are they going to interpret it pretty closely to kind of like how it was put into the Constitution? Turns out, no. Write this down. No. <laughs> Heck no. The Supreme Court. All men, all white, not that that necessarily makes a difference, but perhaps, who knows. These guys were feeling the, uh, <clears throat> that the opinion of the country was such that, you know what, um, we're not going to rock the boat. If that's what they want to do in the South, then that's what they're going to do in the South, and we're not going to really change it. So what they did is they came up with this legal way of dealing with the 14th Amendment. They called it? separate but equal. Separate but equal. So if a state wants to separate whites and blacks, because that's just what happens naturally in the society. They just sort of separate themselves. Have you ever seen that? Like if you take out a, like a bunch of M&Ms, you ever notice they start to gather into little like orange ones and green ones and stuff? Okay. Yeah, so I mean, it's already happening, so if it's no problem, shh, it's no problem, said the Supreme Court in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, 1896, that if the state is already officially, as law, does what is already taking place, then that's okay, as long as they're equal. Now, here is where things get a little bit interesting. Because sometimes you have to sort of tease the argument a little bit to, like, equal. All right, so for example... Is there equality in, raise your, let's, I, I'll challenge you, raise your hand if you can tell me, what equality is there in a part of the train where blacks are and a part of the train where whites are? Go for it. Anybody want to give it a challenge? Go for it. They both get a place to sit. Anything else? Come on, build up the argument. Because, I mean, quick, quick thrown here, like, really, they both get a place to sit? Really, are they really equal as far as they both get a place to sit? Not really, no. There is, there is a qualitative difference as far as like some of the seats. Because, for example, here, if you want a nice place to sit and you're willing to pay for a first-class ticket, those seats are not available for African Americans, even ones that have the wherewithal and want to pay for a first-class ticket. But what else? Victor, I'm not going to let you off the hook. What is equal about that train with the whites and blacks? There you go. They're leaving from the same destination at the same time and arriving at the same time. Wow, that's an equivalence. Good enough for the court. Got that? So the court is not willing to rock the boat. They're being very cautious, and arguably they're not really following the intent of the way the 14th Amendment was written. But then again, this is like, what, almost 30 years after the Civil War? A lot of people are like, oh my gosh, can we just like put that past us and so forth? This is the time period in history where um, in the South, there is a lot of sort of like, 
I don't know, looking back on that period of time and going, you know, these are great people and these were our great Civil War heroes. A lot of the monuments, for example, that were constructed after the Civil War to uh, Confederate generals and so forth were built beginning during that time period. Okay? So it's kind of a way of saying, all right, yeah, we lost the Civil War, but hey, we're going to put some of the things back and we're going to honor those people who were fighting for the cause, the lost cause and so forth. Okay? Do you got that? Now, if that is precedent, if that is the Supreme Court interpretation of the Constitution, what's going to happen, write this down, and I'm not going to give you the name of the case, but I want to say it, it takes place very, very quickly. When somebody comes in to the Supreme Court and says, hey, they're separating black and white kids in the public schools. No, that's going to be later. That's going to be the 1950s. But it's the same kind of case. Can the southern states, and some other states too, it's not just the southern states, some other states, can they separate white and black kids in public schools, or is that a violation of the 14th Amendment? Does a separation on a train, is that like a separation in public schools? Well, guess what the Supreme Court says? Yes, so write that down. So the public schools, following precedent of the Plessy versus Ferguson case, they are separating the kids uh, in the public school settings. Now, this is where it gets a little bit problematic because, in fact, you know, you can be like, well, they're equal, <laughs> separate but equal. In fact, if you looked at the spending for the African-American schools in the Deep South versus the schools that were attended just by the whites, there is a qualitative difference in the amount of money being spent. Do you understand that? Teachers getting paid better in which schools? Textbooks being replaced more regularly in which schools? In fact, they actually would have textbooks that would go to the white schools, and after they got, like, so they're all kind of bad and cruddy and so forth, then they get shipped over to the uh, black schools. Okay, transportation provided for, sometimes you just have a bus going, for the, going to the white schools, and the black kids would have to uh, find their own transportation, typically walking. Heating, other kinds of things. A lot of qualitative differences. Okay? Now, here's what you need to know. Because, let's see if I'm ready for this next one. Yeah, here we go. Segregated public schools for blacks. Look at that. What a qualitative difference. No, you got like one room, and there's, there's the source of heat. And they've got, you know, books on their laps and so forth. I mean, not to say that the white schools are that much better, but they are better qualitatively, okay? Now, this is where, throughout the 1900s, this is where it's kind of like if you see something that not coming your way as far as the Supreme Court, you keep on working it. Here we go. Write this down. The NAACP, N-A-A-C-P, National Association for the Advancement of Colored Persons, I think is how it's referred to now. Okay, NAACP, it is a civil rights group that's been around for a long time, okay? And it, uh, one of the things they spend a lot of time doing is fighting court cases, okay? The NAACP, and they would continually bring court cases up year after year after year after year, putting pressure on the southern states, trying to win over the Supreme Court, right? Is that, a big, is that a big win? If you can get the Supreme Court on your side as far as interpreting the Constitution, is that a big deal? Yeah. Heck yeah, because federal government and who gets the final word on what's in the Constitution? Yeah. Supreme Court. Although the people could amend the Constitution, but it's very, very problematic. By 1954, there was a series of cases coming up. Um, and the Supreme Court had undergone some changes. This is right on the cusp of the Supreme Court becoming more involved, more activist. Although, arguably, when you get this decision, some people could say, hey, their decision is to really interpret the 14th Amendment as it was really written back in the day. But anyway, we'll look at this decision. One of the things that was interesting, they were starting to get some wins. The NAACP and the court cases in the federal courts we're starting to get some wins. For example, they were holding southern school districts feet to the fire, as in you really did have to increase the spending for the all-black schools. 
if you're going to say separate but equal, you really did have to prove that equality as far as spending. You understand? Okay. Was that the goal of the attorneys at the NAACP? That there be equal spending for segregated schools? No. They wanted to get rid of segregated schools. Okay? They wanted there to be no way that a state could say we're going to separate whites and blacks on the basis of, and whites and black children on the basis of their skin color in a public school setting. Okay? So here's what they did. They came up with an interesting argument, and it's going to work. You know how big it works? Two measures. One, they're going to win Brown versus Board of Education, and they're going to reverse Plessy versus Ferguson. That is not a small thing. I hope you understand that. For a Supreme Court to look at pr a previous Supreme Court case and switch it, that's big. It's huge. It takes a whole different way of looking at things, and, <laughs> and they will. Okay, so you know this. Plessy versus Ferguson, is it, good st is it still good law in the country today? No, as of when? 1954, okay. Here's another measure of how big of a deal it was. Nine to nothing decision. Whoa, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. And it was written by the relatively new Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Warren, who had been appointed by Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower. He was the former governor of California, and he is going to be part of what is referred to so-called as the Warren Court. Okay? So there's going to be a lot of interesting cases that come after 1954. Here's another important fact. When the decision was made, was it a popular decision throughout the country? No. You can write that down. In the Deep South, it was a very unpopular decision among many white voters. Okay? They weren't too keen on the Supreme Court stepping in and changing the way that they had been doing public education for years and years and years. Here's another thing. Okay? We're going to get to the, the, the crux of the case here in a moment, but here's another thing just worth pointing out. When the Supreme Court said, as it will, write this down, no more segregated schools, what's another word for desegregate? Integrate. Yeah, you have to integrate the schools. You have to desegregate the schools. How quickly? I love this one. With all deliberate speed. Have you ever, like, had a parent come into your room and look and go, wow, what a mess? With all deliberate speed, I would like you to clean it up. Does, do any of you... I'm just curious because it varies from house to house. When, when, when a parent tells you to clean your room or to do some like task around the house, how many of you would interpret that to be like within the next half hour and you won't be doing anything else until that task gets done? Got it. How many of you guys are like, I interpret that to be like, oh, I don't know, maybe when I get around to it, if I feel like I agree ultimately? Okay. Well, <laughs> The Supreme Court said, you can write this down, with all deliberate speed, they need to, the, segregate, the schools that had segregation had to get rid of that. But there's a lot of different things they have to do. Well, I tell you what, do you think some of those, most of those southern school districts were excited about changing things around? No. All deliberate speed meant, here you go, write this down, it took a long time. It took redrawing this and redrawing that and doing busing. And sometimes, you know, they would draw, draw the lines and go, well, we're not segregated anymore. We just created a little school district around that black neighborhood. And that's their school district. The courts are going to go, uh, no. For example, I was in a school in northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., that was desegregated by busing. And this occurred in 1971, 17 years after, that 17, yeah, 17 years after the Brown versus Board of Education case. I was in the first grade, it was all white, where I went to school in Arlington County, right across from Washington, D.C. I'd say the county was probably about 85, 90% white, give or take. Um, and there were some neighborhoods of African Americans in those neighborhoods, and they were sort of in different, they were like two different clumps in the county. And so they, they, they decided, the court was like, you're going to have to bus. 
And so in the second grade, they bus some kids from Southern Arlington to my school, Jamestown Elementary School. And I remember one of the kids in my class, they were like, they were all excited. They're like, oh my gosh, there's going to be colored kids at school the next day. And he was kind of disappointed because he found out that actually colored kids did not have like a whole Crayola, uh, you know, variety. You know, there wasn't pink and purple and yellow and blue. That's what he thought. He was thinking of like a Crayola box of crayons. And in fact, they were just darker skin. Yeah, that was at the same, how many of you guys are familiar with... Um, Ah, uh, remember the Titans, the movie, okay? That was neighboring uh, uh, Alexandria, and that was the high school, okay? And they had to uh, do integration and so forth, and they had some challenges that they had to deal with as far as their football team, but ultimately, boom, they prevailed and they had a good football team. So, put that down, dragging of the feet. We still haven't gotten to what is it going to take for the Supreme Court to go that extra step, to get rid of separate but equal. And it's going to be very interesting because the Supreme Court is going to take in evidence, psychological evidence, sociological evidence. This is very interesting. I'm going to show you a clip from a movie um, that, that reenacts kind of the, all of the events associated with uh, the Brown versus Board of Education case. Sidney Poitier, the great African-American actor, plays the role of, you can write it down, Thurgood Marshall. Have you heard that name before? Thurgood Marshall is the lead attorney for the NAACP arguing the case before the Supreme Court. Okay? Ultimately, he's going to be the first African-American appointed to the Supreme Court in the latter part of the 1960s. Thurgood Marshall comes up with, and his team, come up with a very innovative approach to arguing the case to the Supreme Court, and, they, and, and the Supreme Court buys it. They buy it. Nine to nothing. They buy it. I mean, they, and they, they're going to do this. This is going to be, this is like nine years before Martin Luther King gives his I Had a Dream speech. This is 11 years before the Voting Rights Act and African Americans are going to have the right to vote in federal law in this country. So this is a bit of ahead of the game. Here's the argument. You commit psychological damage to children if you separate them on the basis of things that they have no control over. The message is that you may be sending them, a me uh, that you may be sending them some kind of a, a signal that the reason you're separating them is because one group is superior to the other. They're, they're not, I mean, sometimes they would say that, you know, we need, yeah, I mean, you're not going to get that officially from, from the, uh, 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 the white dominated southern government saying, you know, yeah, we're, we're doing this officially, but in fact, that's a lot of it. I mean, it's a racist kind of a thing, but sometimes, you know, officially they would go, well, we're just separating you because this is, how many of you guys, how many guys, be honest, how many of you guys separate out your M&Ms? into groups, segregated groups, before you consume them. I do it. I confess. Do they have feelings? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Of course. Uh-huh. And then you chow down on them. Yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, the purpose, ultimately, that's why. Yeah, that's why. Honestly, I look at the M&M's campaign sometimes, I'm like, I'm feeling a little awkward here because it ultimately you've got these live animated characters and so forth, and it is all about consuming them. So anyway, but here's the deal. Yeah. Oh, that's a, now some of them got caramel and some of them, some of them got peanut butter. Anyway, sh but besides the point, here we go. So how do you prove this? Okay, I love how they do this. I'm going to show you the scene from the, from the film Separate But Equal. Okay. How they did it, the psychological test. And literally, I mean, I watched this and I'm like, this is really sad. Caden, you're on notice. Because sometimes you can say things that are really, really um, insensitive. So here's the deal. What they do, you can write this down. They conduct what is called the doll test. And you'll see, you'll see that, okay? So what they do is they bring in a little African-American kid and the psychologist, sociologist, the researcher, 
puts a series of dolls in front of them, different uh, hues of, of dolls, um, you know, dark, dark skinned dolls, light skinned dolls, and so forth. And basically asks a simple question uh, initially, you know, which doll do you prefer? It's a preference thing. Which doll do you prefer? And you would think, perhaps, that African American children might prefer the darker skinned doll because it's closer, perhaps, to their skin color. But what they found consistently was, write this down, the African American kids were choosing the white dolls, a, a fairly high percentage. And then when you had the follow-up question, the follow-up question as to why are you choosing this one, okay? Or can you attribute certain characteristics to the dolls, like pretty, smart. They were attributing pretty and smart to white dolls. They were attributing naughty and ugly to the black dolls. And in fact, one of the kids, even in the thing, uses the N-word to describe the, th the thing. The Supreme Court actually was taken with this psychological, sociological evidence as it was presented that the damage being done to African-American kids with the separated schools was too great and that therefore there was no justification in continuing to do this as a, an official government action and then therefore it violated the 14th Amendment. Do you got that? Okay. I'm going to show you the clip from Separate but Equal with Sidney Poitier and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. Here we go. Yeah, thank you. So this would be like 19, early 1950s. Expert witnesses. That's what we have to do. Show that our clients are irreparably damaged by being forced to attend these dog high schools. Their minds are what's damaged. It isn't easy to prove something you can't see. Bring in Kenneth Clark to do the research, get a court order. That he can do the research. Of course, he's got to come down into the South, which is where the, I think this is a South Carolina case. The Brown case actually came out of Oklahoma, where there was segregation as well. What's in your briefcase? <laughs> yeah, and there's like ever present intimidation going on, officially and unofficially. Federal judge. All right, Professor Clark, you can go ahead with your experiments. A court order or no court order? You just get this one finished in two days to get on out of ground and capital. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Mm.
show me a color palette. Tell me what color you like that. Show me the doll that has a nice color. Show me the doll that is ugly. One of the kid's dads was afraid of uh, joining the lawsuit. He was afraid he was going to be intimidated, lose privileges at work, stuff like that. Maybe lose his job. Here's the dad coming in the room. I was like, yeah, I think I'll uh, join that lawsuit, which he did. Yeah. Yeah, there he is, Thurgood Marshall, right there in the middle as part of his legal team that won the case. And, of course, deliber all deliberate speed. All right, there we go, Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, strict scrutiny, write this down. Strict scrutiny is going to be the basis if the government wants to, this is going to be an interpretation of the 14th Amendment. As we go through 14th Amendment cases, we're going to see three different scrutiny tests that the Supreme Court will use on different kinds of discrimination. Strict scrutiny is going to be the toughest one for a government to get around if they want to treat people differently. Okay, you ready? For strict scrutiny, the government is going to have to show you have to have a compelling government interest in order to treat people differently. And the category that they're going to put racial discrimination in is going to be the strict scrutiny one. In other words, you're going to have a really hard time as a government ever saying, okay, we're going to treat people differently based on racial circumstances. Hold off on other ones. We'll get to intermediate scrutiny, which is going to be what's going to be used for gender-based discrimination. And then there'll be one called rational basis, which is going to be used for like, you know, age discrimination and some other things. But hold off on that. So that's going to be the toughest one, race-based government discrimination. Okay? Um, it's going to be a challenge. One of the things that I think is interesting, I'm going to share with you this, is an educational challenge. Woo! There was a teacher in the early 1960s, I want to say somewhere in the Midwest, um, in a pretty much homogenous, mostly white uh, community, and she was trying to get through her kids' 
the idea about racial discrimination and discrimination against people who are, you know, Native American and so forth. And like, what would it be like? She conducted a very controversial experiment over the course of two days. And she had it filmed. You're going to watch some of the filming of this. In fact, you'll see some of it where they're grown up and they're looking at the filming of it and they're kind of laughing, you know, how they were when they were little kids. What she does is she says, okay, I'm trying to get a sense across to you what discrimination is like and how that would feel and what it would go through to actually be treated like you are inferior based on something that you have no control over. And this was the blue, brown eyes, blue eyes experiment. Presumably, I don't know, I always wonder, it's like, are there any green-eyed kids in that group and so forth? But presumably, at least in her small uh, class of fourth, fifth graders, I forget, um, they all got either brown or, or blue. So what she says to them is, she creates like this fake um, scientific information, which all that, all that she needs is to just say it, and the kids buy into it. I mean, sometimes she just sort of says, like, well, let's, what would it be like if? And they just buy into it. What would it be like if brown-eyed kids were inferior? They're troublesome. They don't do well in, in, in work. Uh, they're naughty. And we need to treat them separately. They need to not have as much freedom at recess. They need to have all kinds of various different things, right? Whereas the blue-eyed kids are superior, I mean, like, who would ever come up with that, Hitler? Um, who would ever imagine, like, that there's one, you know, like, that a characteristic? Is, do you guys have any opinion on, on who is more clever, better, superior, as far as eye color? I'm looking around. You are? Whatever color your eyes. You're like, whatever I am. And get this. I mean, this is where it really starts to be like, because, I mean, when Hitler did this in the 1930s to make sure that people would like separate out from, uh, from Jewish uh, people living in the community before he ultimately rounded them up and killed as many as he could. What they would have to do is they would have to wear identifying tags. The Star of David in Germany. Here, she said, okay, those of you guys who have whatever the suspect group is, you have to wear these collars so that everyone can see. You know, they don't have to go look up right close to see whether you got brown or blue eyes. You have to wear these collars. You understand that? And so that's what they did. They practiced discrimination on each other, and it went south very fast. What would happen to the kids just in a short period of time if they're told that they're dumb, that they're not quality, that they're poorly behaved, and so forth? That's how they're going to act. And they act up, and they don't perform as well on these academic tests and so forth. And s friendships like start severing. Of course, the next day, you know what she does? She flips it. Yeah, and I mean, she can throw in sort of like, well, you know, actually, you know, maybe I read this wrong or whatever, you know, had it all flipped around. And, of course, the kids that were in the collar that were being treated as the second-class citizens, they're like, huh, this is going to be fun. We've got to be on top this time. You got that? Oh, yeah, maybe. That would buy into it, yeah. 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 So, I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> we're not going to try this. I think you would have to get, <laughs> you know, like, so much permission. But they did it then, and here's what you got. Those kids actually did gain a real appreciation of it sucks to be told that you suck on the basis of something you have no control over. I'll show you a clip here from the Brown Eyes, Blue Eyes uh, documentary film. Here we go. And the subtitles are in Turkish. So it was the only one I could find. I'm not in Turkish, I'm sorry. Something Asian. No problem throwing out that word, huh? Woof.
Do you guys think you know how it would feel? Ooh, let's do this. <laughs> okay, lemmings. <laughs> let's bully each other. <laughs> okay, here we go. Shh, shh. How do you know? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. He's not buying it. He's blue. Because he's fair. <laughs> What a nice kid. <laughs> Use the yardstick on him. <laughs> yeah, teachable moment, yeah. <gasps> She's feeling it. That girl is feeling it. Yeah, how's recess going to go? You think? Insight. <laughs>
Keep your eyes, whatever color they are, on the screen. I got blue. What do you think? Uh, Scandinavian heritage. <laughs> Third graders. In space of 15 minutes. Yesterday, I told you that brown eyed people aren't as good as blue eyed people. That wasn't true. I lied to you yesterday. <laughs> Oops. So, the truth is that brown eyed people are better than blue eyed people. <laughs> Oops. No, she's got cool glasses. <laughs> Selective data. chain on someone else. <laughs> Make sure it's tight. <laughs> oh, she's happy now. He's not happy. Oh, if looks could kill. <laughs> very sad. Very, very sad. Who can tell me what contraction should be in the first sentence? Go to the board and write it, John. Come on, let's do it again. Loosen up. Up, up, up. Ooh. Come on. That's better now. You know how to make a W? Okay, write the contraction for You know you guys know how to make a W like that? Y'all don't learn nothing these days, huh? <laughs> Hmm. Wow. Pile it on. Up. Oh, here we go. Ecologically unfriendly. Destroy the planet. I use that even on the phonics. We use the card pack. And the children, the brown eyed children, were in the whole class the first day. And it took them five and a half minutes to get through the card pack. The second day, it took them two and a half minutes. The only thing that changed was the fact that now they were superior people. Collars on. Ah. <sighs> 